The talk is about the title of the talk, which I have unfortunately had only two days to prepare and not full days at that, because I have to satisfy clients and they get crazy sometimes. Makers, hackers, and the personal computer revolution. Um, now, I sort of expected that uh, I would have been introduced as in terms of how I fit in there. Um, and I, I don't want to say too much, but I have to say something, which is to say that uh, you can look me up. In fact, uh, there's a website uh, that I've created for self-promotion. That is, the uh, URL is listed on the website here, uh, leefelsenstein.com. And most of my story can be read there. Um, I was a founder of well, Osborne Corpora Computer Corporation, but that was rather late in the game in 1981. In 1975, I was a for an original participant in the Homebrew Computer Club, and by the fourth meeting that year, I had taken over the uh, running the meeting as what I called the Toastmaster. Uh, I consider the meeting process to be one of my most productive designs because at least 23 companies formed out of that meeting, including Apple and what became InfoWorld. Um, before that, I had uh, explored in the nascent computer or personal computer underground, which were people meeting in potlucks and so forth, talking about the day when there would be personal computers and what would they be like and how might they be designed. Um, and I came to that from um, my experience with the first social, first public social media, Community Memory in 1973, uh, where I encountered the problem of how to make computer hardware survive in a public access environment. So my thinking evolved along those lines, coming from social media, basically. Um, now, and along the way, uh, the, if, if by chance you use a personal computer, uh, then you will be using the architecture of display. Thank you very much, Mr. Or is it Dr. Mia? Um, we'll explain that later. Uh, uh, then you are using the arch display architecture that I specified in 1974 and sold for 50 cents a copy. Um, the specification, that is, not the architecture. So uh, that explains uh, the, ex the description that I was somehow responsible for the design of the personal computer. I'll argue that separately. That's not relevant here. We're now seeing the phenomenon of the, what's called the maker movement. And this seems like a kind of uh, up-to-date crafts movement where people just like to build things and get together and talk about them and show them off and so forth. Uh, and it's um, getting more and more press now that there are, quote, 3D printers which there had been beforehand, but they were rather expensive, but now they're very cheap, relatively low quality, but therefore available printers, the MakerBot. Uh, let's write that down because I couldn't even remember the name until now. Oops, no, we're over here, MakerBot. I'll get under there. There we go. Um, there we are. Um, and now there is a great deal of, of talk about how um, uh, you'll be, everyone will have a, a 3D printer on their, in their home and we will make whatever we need and so forth. This also has been one of the subjects of the, I believe it's Neil Stevenson book, um, the, the Diamond Age, where there are s compilers, matter compilers, and uh, that leads to a whole uh, science fiction universe. So are we entering the science fiction universe right now in which every consumer is a producer 
and that everything will be manufactured with this marvelous new addi additive process. Um, well, for those of us who've been involved in the manufacture of things, you can't just write off the subtractive processes, drilling holes and a few things like that. Um, but it's got a lot of press, and the question is, is this a revolution or what? Or is this the just irrelevant uh, hobbyists uh, wasting time, and it really doesn't matter? Now, the interesting part is that we've been there before, because in for the first few years of the personal computer industry, before there was a, quote, killer app, um, there was that exact critique leveled at us. That we don't understand why uh, you're working with these little tiny 8-bit machines with almost no memory. Why not go find a real computer you can play with? And we don't see what you're doing, and you can't even explain why you're doing it. The, the, the major two applications that were mentioned, whenever someone asked, what, are you what do you plan to run on your home computer? The major two applications were I'm go balancing ch my checkbook and managing recipe files. I don't believe that anybody ever actually did those two things, at least for many years until there were programs that could handle them. But this was the justification, and it was transparently false. Um, but uh, the it didn't stop us the point. We were at it for some other reason. I would suggest that uh, uh, people look up uh, John Markoff's book, the What the Dormouse Said, uh, for more discussion of this. Reading that book, to which I was a contributor in terms of interviews, uh, made me understand that um, the person who marketed the personal computer before it existed was Stuart Brand through the Whole Earth Catalog. By, you know, marketing is the sale of the idea of a product. So you don't really need to have a product. Uh, and it helps a great deal if you do the marketing before you create the product. And that's what happened. Uh, they, you can go read back issues of the Whole Earth Catalog or just look at their statement of purpose in which they're saying, we are as gods, so we might as well get good at it. Uh, I think that's still a little, a little arrogant to declare oneself as gods. We act as gods, though that might have been more accurate. And um, the uh, important issue for the uh, Whole Earth Catalog was selling the idea that People who felt that they could have no serious effect on technology uh, actually had a need to learn their way into whatever technologies they felt was important. And so they were talking about oh, knives and uh, stoves and so forth. It started out, well, I'm not going to get into the history of the of uh, the Whole Earth Catalog, that'll take too long. But they were talking to an audience of hippies and trying to convince them to get their hands dirty with technology. An interesting, well, that's not, not makers yet, but close. And uh, th when the personal computer arrived, and the first article for it uh, described it as a mini computer, um, the um, Nobody knew what to do with it. After all, it was just a box with lights and switches and uh, had almost nothing in it. In fact, uh, a friend of mine, Bob Marsh, with whom I rented a garage in the hopes of designing some products and putting them out, noticed there was nothing in the box. And he went into business to put things to fit in it, uh, to fill the box. Uh, and I helped him. So we have... Uh, the Maker Fair now uh, has, I don't know how many people here have been to the Maker Fair. Of course, I can't poll the audience but uh, online. But um, it seems one, uh, one way of looking at it is as a, a uh, kind of test run for uh, uh, Burning Man. 
uh, machinery. You get lots of flames and so forth and psychedelic looking monsters clattering along and little muffins uh, on little scooters that you can get into and drive as packs. It's really Alice in Wonderland stuff. Also there's Tesla coils and robot wars going on in one corner. I think in one place they have a tank and you have naval robot wars. Uh, you can buy Japanese electronic kits with vacuum tubes in them and so forth. Um, all pretty marvelous. And there's a big section with just plain arts and crafts like needlework and so forth. That's all considered part of it. Now, so uh, what is this supposed to, be, to mean? It's, 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 is this the future? I, I, I don't know. I don't think so. But uh, back in the 70s, uh, there were some people who felt that uh, we would make every kid a hacker, that everybody who had a personal computer would be, have it in order to, quote, write good code. That's what Byte Magazine's basic purpose was. Uh, and so we would all be compiling and so forth. And uh, I don't know quite why, but that didn't matter. Um, now, we'd, it was always, and is still in this case, a, a very interesting show, an attractive phenomenon. Um, and the, in both cases, they were dealing with reorganizing technology-based production. Now, that sounds extremely pretentious, and it is when you say it that way. But people had an urge to gain increasing control over the process of development of technologies that affected them or potentially affected them. The f opening shot in the, quote, personal computer revolution did not occur in 1975, but in 1973 in a magazine that was aimed at radio and TV repair technicians, something we don't seem to have anymore. Um, it was a trade I had learned as a kid. And it was the TV typewriter, um, whereby you could type on a homemade keyboard and show your letters and numbers, whatever you type, show up on your television screen. This promised a certain capability of control of both digital technology and video technology. If you could control what went on your screen, well, this was quite something. And they got an overwhelming response. Uh, they, uh, they expected 20 paid uh, uh, responses for plans. They got 10,000. And uh, it was, again, the friend, uh, the Bob Marsh, who rented that garage with me, he had actually gone ahead and attempted to build it. And I stress the word attempted because he did not fully succeed. Many people did not fully succeed and learned digital electronics and, in fact, some analog electronics, too. The way that was designed, it was both. Um, and so therefore, the, the, I have increasing the understanding, hands-on visceral understanding of technologies was a desired but not expressed uh, goal for people who participated certainly in the personal computer effort and I presume in the maker effort. And so moving from the position of being simply a consumer, a user, a subject of the technology, doing things the way the technology is designed, and it's designed by other people who are somewhere else, who knows, now they're in China, to being people who can define the technologies that they have to deal with. This, I think, was the attraction. And in fact, it, it uh, is a pent-up kind of demand that's been building ever since we've had industrial society. Um, now, both examples uh, were subject to ridicule, um, and you know the PCs are just toy computers. They don't. What can they do after all? They couldn't do anything. And so with the 3D printers, we can say, oh, well, look, this MakerBot thing. It's almost made of cardboard. You know, it's, it's, look, it's, it breaks down constantly. You have to keep trimming it to make it work right. And a precision is not much. Uh, what's the point? 
open question that is uh, what we're going to explore here. And of course, the people who were doing it were simply not qualified. Uh, when, we, when we had the meetings of the Homebrew Computer Club, we pretty much did not receive visitors from on high, from Xerox Park and so forth. Why would they come to a place like that and uh, talk with people who did not know most of what they knew? Uh, these are people who were trying to get a hold of or build or otherwise find a computer that they could do something with, they could learn their way in. Anybody who was really a professional in the field already had that access and, and didn't need to involve themselves in this grungy stuff. So uh, I could say that the people who were attending those sessions were second string and below. And it included a significant uh, stratum of physicians who probably should have been engineers. Uh, they, had, they had money available and they knew how to study their way into something. And so that was the largest group that I could identify. And there were also the ham radio people, but you can always expect them. So it was all dismissed as mere hobbyists and crafters. And just don't bother about it. It's not going to amount to anything. Well, there's, that's taking a kind of a static view of, OK, there's these people, there's these things. I see them, and uh, I judge them, and that's it. But what's going on is a process involving the people. People learn. This was a major way for them to learn, us to learn, in a way. You know, I, I learned a lot myself. And we're developing different models. It happened in, in computers, and it, I think it will happen in, in the uh, maker universe, uh, for developing different models of uh, product definition, uh, market definition, and uh, development of expectations. This is something that anybody in marketing should pay attention to because that's what they, that's their product, is expectations and definitions. Um, for the first four years, uh, like I say, there was no, quote, killer app. There's no real justification for, uh, in software for a personal computer. Then we had VisiCalc. And then uh, people would uh, come up to uh, Frankston and, uh, Bricklin, and when they ran, and when they found out who they were, accountants would come up to them and congratulate them. You're the guys that made accounting fun. Uh, and in fact, they made modeling, spreadsheet modeling, uh, as close to fun as it can be for those of us who had to do it and didn't you know, really want to. Uh, I planned uh, a whole project on uh, our Osborne SuperCalc spreadsheet and was really quite amazed by, by how you could you know, alter the numbers and everything changed out and so forth. Now we expect that. But that was brand new and you know, the, the, the whole idea of making it fun is a very powerful uh, element in making a technology uh, alive, let's say. Um, so the, the, in both cases, we're taking serious stuff, technology, and turning it into toys, things you play with. Now, the, the, the computer professionals of the 70s really did not like that. Uh, one of them, Herb Grosch, uh, made a, a visit to the Homebrew Club, I think, in late 75, and was writing columns for Computer World. I believe he was the editor of Computer World at that time. And that was the really serious computer paper. It was, you know, IBM all the way and so forth. And that had already, <coughs> my mic fell. The, uh, 
He came through, it, 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 Colin, before his visit, said, I heard that these guys are actually sharing software. I'll believe that when I see it. The column after was like, my god, these people are sharing software. They've got to stop doing this. Uh, didn't make any difference to us. We really didn't care what he said. Um, but the process of play and the process of making technologies are, in fact, not as separate and ought not to be separate or considered as separate and in opposition. Play is a very fundamental motiva motivation. Play, sport, whatever. Sport is universal throughout humanity. And it has no rational uh, justification. Uh, yes, you can say that if you gain status through sport, then you can gain reproductive advantage. That's what the sociobiologist would say. Um, but there are other ways to do that and uh, that aren't as hard on the body. Still, uh, people do it. And in fact, people play with tools when they're not supposed to. It's a major source of accidents with tools. Uh, and if you're planning the use of tools, you have to make some, take account of the fact that somebody's going to figure out a way to play with this thing and it could hurt somebody. Um, it's there, it happens, and it's how we instinctively learn as kids and I believe that we never grow out of it. Um, so the, looking at the, the, the maker's phenomenon as just crafts, well, all right, that's what is crafts, but it's play with physical things that you put together. Uh, okay, and so now adding in additional technologies uh, simply changes the, what you're playing with, not doesn't really change the process. And it's something that just arose. You know, it's not like somebody uh, put a stake in the ground and said, now people are going to play. They don't have to do that. It's built in. So the... Uh, Claims that arise from observing this can, of course, be overblown. Um, the, I, 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 for the little bit of research I did for this talk, um, I saw the article, the, the video talk, actually, by Chambers. Is it Paul Chambers? or I don't remember the first name. He's the editor of Wired. And he's very enthusiastic. In fact, he started a little business himself, making some stuff. And he believes that, and I've heard this before, everybody's going to have a 3D printer on their desk. OK, I, yeah, thanks. We know wh where this goes. It's, it, it, it isn't that everybody's going to have a 3D printer. But there will be 3D printers and their successors available uh, as things go forward. Now. Some of his statements are, of course, quite uh, perceptive, and, uh, and I'll have to agree with him, which is to say that this, the, the meaning of the phenomenon is that it lowers the barriers to entry into design and production. And so, yes, things will still be made in countries like China, but you no longer will have to guarantee an order of a million parts to get anything. The minimum is already going down, as I have recently discovered. Uh, of course, you still have to deal with the fact that it's being done so far away by people you never meet, etc. Uh, but those are m that's mere reality, not, not concept. The, you'll be able to... Uh, According to Chambers, uh, you'll deal, be able to deal in quantities of 10,000. But if 10,000, why not 1,000? Why not 100? Uh, at a certain point, it's, well, it's all a matter of, of uh, the fixed costs. Like, you know, transportation is not exactly a fixed cost because it varies with weight. I guess getting the fixed costs down. And what are the fixed costs? The fixed costs are the cost of ro running the organization that is creating the... the uh, product. 
And there are plenty of ways of spreading that out, of reducing the thickness of that organization. Uh, it's not as if things have to be done on the price models that, that currently exist. If you can come through with, say, 100 clients, each of whom has their own design, and which who use standardized file structures and so forth to, in order to express that design. And if you deal with them, if you can aggregate this, you can get someone with a serious factory in China to pay attention. Now, I'm not saying that I've done this, but I'm saying that this is how it can be done. Uh, what you don't do is tell the people who, come, who would come to you to, oh no, talk to that factory, because they will get turned down. Uh, but if you can aggregate them and work with them closely to uh, make sure that their requirements fit with the capabilities, but you're performing an intermediary function there that the factory simply is not equipped to do. And so this is what's coming, I believe. Uh, yes, produc some production will be moving back up here, or meaning we'll be setting up again in the US to work at smaller scale production. Uh, and some will stay overseas. This all has to do with factors that involve supply chains and relationships and so forth, and all of that changes. Um, <coughs> sorry. The, uh, issues of, well, mass production are going to yield to these sorts of uh, structures. <coughs> Sorry. Right now, uh, whatever gets produced is produced because somebody puts a certain amount of money up. It also is produced that way because it's not that different from what's being produced otherwise, originally. Uh, you have to, you can draw a matrix of features and quantity and so forth. And when you move from one to the other, it's like you're a pawn on a chessboard. You can only make one move in one direction, one step. You can't move from here over to the other corner and have it work within the manufacturing structure that, and the marketing structure that currently exists. Well, of course, those structures are human structures. They can change. Uh, the, the issue of, of uh, product lifetime and obsolescence works both ways. Products don't last long enough and they can products stick around too long. Uh, some people want the newer, newer things and will pay for it. And some people want to hold on to the familiar old things and don't mind if they don't have the newer thing. Well, as it stands now in general and within a, a product line and there's a road map and so forth and you well, try to buy a small memory chip today. It can't be done. They don't make them anymore. Oh, yes, you can buy some out of collector's stocks, but not for anything that needs any quantity. Um, so we can see that as long as there is a market that is aggregated, in other words, that you deal with a relatively small number of channels to get things moving out into the market, it's viable, as long as the money flows and so forth. Um, the uh, managerial structure involved in handling these decisions does not have to be there to any significant extent if the aggregation is external. Uh, it's only when you're a GM or something like that and then you have piles and piles of management making God knows what decisions which result in a two-year product cycle at the fastest. Uh, then you, that's kind of set up for competition from somebody who doesn't have to meet those kind of managerial requirements. Um, and then there's responsiveness to the uh, to customer feedback. Uh, it, you know, I, I bought an ironing board at one point and uh, the thing fell over. Uh, so wisely I 
called or otherwise contacted the number on the little paper that you normally throw away and said, uh, my ironing board fell over. I'm going to have to take it back. And they said, wait, 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 wait. We'll, sen we'll, we'll send you a new one. And I got a new one with a broadened stance, which hasn't yet fallen over. Uh, and it's like they weren't expecting, I mean, they did not, as far as I can tell, this was, an, this, this was not happening every day. Um, because if it was, they weren't going to send free ironing boards. But um, I think the, the, let's just put it this way. There are many companies I can think of that would have had a, a, a procedure all in place to make sure that, that that request was answered courteously and then ignored. Um, so I saved the cost of an ironing board, but uh, the um, perception of product value uh, goes up when you have a, a, a responsive structure. So. Well, it goes up when you think there's a responsive structure. If you don't, if they have one and you don't know it, then well, yes, right. Okay. Point conceded. Um, or if they, you think they have one and they don't, you get the same value. That's possible, but that's a different lecture. <laughs> that's a dealing in perceptions, um, and part of this is dealing in perceptions. No. No uh, question about that. You know, think about what uh, what would someone who is in the uh, software market, in the software industry, say, who in in the 1960s and 70s say about the, the today's software market? What would they say about the 99 cent app? Well, in some ways, I was not call Herb the computer person. He was a data processor, and that's what data animation and those those things were about. They were about batch processing, and they were big on efficiency. And they did not believe in inter interaction. I mean, I, I could not believe when I entered the workforce how anti-interaction a lot of my colleagues were. Oh, that interaction is threatening. Well, it's not only like that too, but actually, I found a wonderful paper by our friend Knuth entitled, Are Toy Programs Useful? And he's a big proponent of games and toy problems. Excellent. And I got a check out of him for that. You, you got a check out of I him? I found a typo. Oh, I see. In a long, <laughs> in a long you know, <coughs> error. So that's a, that's a way of correcting it. I'll say, I'm the one that's supposed to be bragging here, not you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but consider this. I mean, how radically the market in software has changed and the whole definition of software. Yes, it's, it's moved from data processing to uh, individual applications or apps, you know, it's like uh, things that make things happen on little things you hold in your hand. And this was, uh, if somebody had had to make that leap uh, as if they were a time traveler, it would be very difficult for them to really grasp what, what the situation was like. Well, we're going to be getting closer to that situation. Um, the major aspect here is, I think, the, the empowerment of the, of the creative impulse, which is uh, definitely present. I mean, where did graffiti come from? <laughs> it's not pleasant, but it's still creative. Definitely an impulse situation. But uh, more than that, the impulse to increase and, ex ex and share and ex extend knowledge. Uh, there's a few places I see we can put the, the uh, this in there. Tech shop, Maker Fair and Noise Bridge Tech Shop. And for those who don't know, and I guess that's my point to speak to those who don't know, um, originated in Mountain View, it's uh, basically a machine shop where you pay a monthly, used to be 100, it's probably a little more by now, dollar uh, 
membership fee and you can come in at any time and you can get trained in the use of the machines which do require training because playing with those things you'll lose a hand or something um, but uh, they have done a wonderful job of providing an environment within which that becomes possible so with somebody who really does not know how things are made will learn first hand how things are fabricated and in fact that's I can't say it's completely, but it started out certainly being all subtractive, cutting metal and so forth, or plastic. By now, I'm sure they have 3D printers too. And you get to see what they can do versus what other things can do. No better way to learn. The Maker Faire occurs uh, at essentially uh, Memorial Day, end of May. But now it's May 16th through, I believe, 18th at the San Mateo County Fairgrounds. And there's one in September uh, in uh, New York. At, in uh, Queens. Um, that is, I highly recommend it. It costs money to attend, I mean, $30 or thereabouts, but the people watching is wonderful because uh, there's a lot of people more or less like you who are encountering a lot of things for the first time. And it's very interesting to see those things also. I mean, if you were there alone, it would still be interesting but not nearly as interesting as there with thousands of people. Um, and the noise bridge is a, an example of one of the early generation hacker spaces. That's in San Francisco. And they are a, uh, an anarchically, ru anarchically run, I suppose, organization. Uh, there was a point at which I got the idea of what amounts to the hacker space and hold a little birds of a feather session on it and Jacob Applebaum, who was one of the founders of Noisbury, showed up and he was there to say this is the way to do it. Because they were doing it. Great having an idea that somebody has already implemented. Uh, it validates the idea. But it's not, it, it's one way of doing it which I consider to be highly intriguing, to say the least. Somebody's got to keep it organized and I suppose they do. Um, but it, people can just show up, no membership, doesn't cost anything, and there's tools to use, there's people who will presumably teach you how to use them, and uh, uh, some stock of parts, and somehow it doesn't fall apart. It sort of works. There's also, in a somewhat more uh, organized fashion, the Hacker Dojo. Uh, they've got a website, they're a 501c3, and they have just, as of today, moved into a new space in uh, Mountain View. Uh, interestingly, well, they started in a set of, <coughs> call them garage shops, um, and it had previously been a stained glass, uh, f call it a factory or a workshop. There's plenty of interesting stained glass around. And they began trying to, they, they defined themselves as a club. And you paid a, a, a <coughs> monthly membership uh, fee. And you could come in and basically use the place for technology development, for, but mostly software. Lots and lots of classes were held there. And then they also had events, you know, parties and so forth. And the city eventually came down and said, no, you, you have to have other, you have to meet these qualifications if you're going to have all these people in here. And the solution for that, after about a year's worth of effort fundraising and uh, back and forth, was that they rented another building. But they kept the old one because there were always people who started up there. They started got the, met the people they needed to meet, worked up the idea for the uh, project, for the, pro, for the product, and started developing. And then they said, can we sort of camp out here and make this our startup? Well, the answer was no, because a lot of other people wanted to use that space. And that is fundamentally what that old space is now going to be used for. They're going to be leasing it out uh, to anybody who shows up who can put up the money, I suppose. I don't know that there's any decision process involved. I mean, obviously, if you're going to be doing something that's 
dangerous, they need to know about it and they'll pass judgment on it. So they have a new place. Um, I was just over there last night helping to put together the, uh, the uh, workbenches uh, for the hardware shop. Uh, and uh, it's very pretty. So uh, Hacker Dojo, as the name implies, is just sort of a, a software workout studio, you might say. And uh, there is a hardware component to it. Who knows what is going on? The, the whole universe of uh, certainly iOS uh, devices and their applications got a big boost, uh, gets a boost from, from places like Hacker Dojo. The fellow who is uh, working on the software for the project that I have to do right now uh, I would always find him in the dojo whenever I went in there. I went to go into the hardware shop and there he would be. And no matter what you were talking about, he would soon be joining in the conversation and trying to point out why he knew better. <laughs> this is a common problem. And uh, apparently he did that for the better part of a year and put together enough contacts to start uh, basically to go into business uh, both creating iOS products and uh, contracting out in the development of the mostly software for that. And I've been involved with him both ways as a contractor. Uh, so the, the, these kinds of uh, spaces, these are you call, have to call it public. If you just have to pungle up a little money to, to be there, it's public enough. It's not like somebody is, has to decide, has to, to you know, turn thumbs up or thumbs down on you. Um, and so that kind of public space is quite valuable because it's focused in a certain area, focused in the area of, of technology. There's plenty of other such public spaces that need to be empowered further. And my particular project throughout my career seems to have been uh, focused on working out technologies that empower public uh, spaces for this kind of purpose. Well, let me end right there. I've run off the end of my notes. And uh, let's see what uh, questions we might have. Yes. Well. First off, I, I've actually been to all of those places. I have a tech shop membership. I had a do Hacker Dojo membership. I've been to Noise Bridge, and I've shown at Maker Fair. And I just do not see this as the cutting edge of technology or leading to the future in any useful way. Uh, tech shop has good machinery, which is basically used to do arts and crafts stuff. There's like some one guy is building a nozzle for an X Prize second stage rocket, but that's about as advanced as it gets. There's a group that says designed in Silicon Valley, made in Silicon Valley. And what they're making are, are, are cheapy little plastic things to attach a, an iPhone to your car dashboard with a suction cup. This is pathetic. Um, Hacker Dojo, they had a good machine learning class. I, 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 I took that whole thing. But mostly what I saw going on there is a couple of, there are people who rent space there and they do their business there. Uh, there are people who build I mean, they had a, they had a surface mount soldering station. I never saw anybody use it. Most of the I saw people having LAN parties because um, they had lots of tables with electrical outlets. Um, Maker Fair is an arts and craft show, really. Uh, if, if you show there and you're not selling something, you're you're acting as free entertainment for the vendors. Uh, Noise Bridge is cool. Uh, you know, good art projects come out of there. But you know, people have been doing cool art projects for a long time. Uh, but I do not see this as the beginnings of something like the, per, the personal computer revolution. I mean, the, 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 the real world, I mean, people have been saying that for years. There was this big boom in the 50s for do it yourself. And where did that go? Well, can I say well, something? I, I see something in, <clears throat> you were talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, the first computers, and we're going to do recipe files and balance our checkbooks, and I tried. And we also had to learn basic and stuff. So a lot of the reason people bought personal computers is they thought they could play a game or something like that. But they soon found out they had to learn how to program to get anything done. And you wound up with something like a program. 
Well, now we have these 3D printers that are becoming more popular. It's not ubiquitous yet. And the first thing most people find out to buy one is you've got to learn a 3D CAD programming language to do anything with it. And that's not as much fun as watching this thing spit out pistols or whatever you make with the damn thing. But what you're going to wind up with, hopefully, is the people that are now fluent in this new language and when and if 3D printers, and I hope they get to be as good as on Star Trek or something, you know, will now have at least a big beginnings of a language so that somebody could talk to it to make something. Right? I mean, VisiCalc didn't start with VisiCalc and then Apple II came out. The Apple II came out and it was pretty pathetic, but then it's a platform. And I think we're a ways off from getting a 3D printer that's as good as anything on Star Trek, but I think we'll get something better than what we have now. Everything, all the criti criticisms you leveled there, <coughs> A, are pretty much true. B, were similar to criticisms leveled in the first few years of the personal computer industry. Um, and I think what Al was saying about the fact that people, when they get involved in this, learn that they have to be, they have to learn more about other things that work like languages and so forth. It's in that kind of dynamic that you get uh, beyond what you see on, on hand, if you see what I mean. In other words, yes, you didn't see this or that. It's true, it's not there yet. But the people are, are, who are there are learning why they need to go further than that. Uh, you know, the, one of the, the uh, claims that I find somewhat laughable about the 3D printers is, oh, well, they'll be able to manufacture their, themselves and, and therefore self-replicate. Well, anybody who knows about uh, tolerance stacking knows that that is hopeless. Uh, somebody might come up with some solution there, but I'm not sure what it's going to be. Uh, the, you know, making multiple generation copies is the example in two dimensions. Um, so there's one of the points I was trying to make here was that it is oversold at the present time. And in fact, the, there is much more to, that has to be done before it becomes, uh, call it viable, if it, if it, before it becomes more than play. But it, I believe this, is, this has happened before and will happen again. This is not something where it's at a dead end. Uh, Randy? Yeah, I mean, um, so isn't the point, I, I think you made it well uh, when talking about the homebrew computer, but isn't the point, it isn't that those people all went on to change the world. It's that in that mix, there were some who went off and tried things in other realms, whether it be retail or manufacturing or whatever. You said most of them were doctors, right? They were well, <coughs> most of them, a lot of yeah, them. Yeah, most of those guys did not go off and found Apple, right? But they provide, it, that, those provide an environment, and I know this is the case for me, they were this, where stuff happens. <coughs> and if that environment doesn't exist, uh, if it, I can tell you it doesn't exist at Yahoo. It doesn't exist as much as it used to at IBM in those places, just like it did then. Um, but these are just a potential uh, primordial soup where something might happen. And you won't necessarily even ha see it happening there. But when you trace back from when the changes come in this area, you'll find them running right through those piles of soup. I was at a book party, was this 93 or something, for Esther Dyson's book, Release 2.0. It was held at uh, the offices of uh, Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield Buyer, the then premier venture capital firm. Uh, Sand Hill Road. And a little man with uh, glasses came up to me and said, you probably don't remember me. I used to attend the meetings of the Homebrew Computer Club. You know, and many people do this, and I'm, I learned the hard way that I have to be polite and forthcoming and congratulatory and so forth, even when they're trying to project on me things that don't fit. And it turned out this was John Doerr. He had been an engineer at Intel in 1980 and attending the club meetings. And I said, whoops, uh, yes, things happen, don't they? Um, I, of course, tried to follow up on that and see if I could get it. Uh, 
job out of it, but that didn't work <laughs> out. Um, he knew his business. Uh, did I have one over here? Or no? Okay. Oh, I, I was going to guess who this small, sharp, oh, involved young man might be, but but I spoiled it. Spoil. More discussion? Uh, there. Um, just kind of a question about building communities. Could you just kind of talk a little bit about how you know, the experience of how these communities get started and how they're kind of organized and <coughs> how to make them successful? Well, that's that's quite a big question and sort of should be the topic for a completely different talk, but it is, of course, related. Um, and, you know, I don't have a five-word answer uh, to that question. It's a very big open question. But um, the important thing is that to bear in mind that the stuff of community is communication. A community can be defined as a group of people who communicate and then parenthetically around some area on a regular basis. And if you take that approach, that's where I started with the social media uh, concepts that I helped Im implement. And I ran into enough people who had basically come to the same conclusion as well, that we are actually able to try something. Um, so the, the uh, important element of creation of communities is to recognize the process that's underway and to set up structures that uh, facilitate the process or at least do not hamper it. So my example here, the counter example to the homebrew club is the Southern California Computer Society. And this, you probably never heard of them, but with good reason. Um, they were organized according to, they were run by Robert's Rules of Order, they had officers, they had budget, and so forth and so on. They had a magazine, which was Interface Age, I think, and they had politics. And that really f completely frustrated anything that they might have done. Uh, I remember being politicked by some of their people uh, in, a, in a process that I really didn't recognize. <coughs> and uh, I don't think I was any help to them, uh, but the Southern California Computer Society dis dissolved in uh, acrimonious politics. <coughs> the magazine was taken away uh, and uh, had an independent existence. And so it might, I won't say that it might never, might as well not have existed. I'm sure some benefit came from it, but it's very hard to, to uh, find anyone who will talk about it. Well, so if you, you, if you have the opportunity to set up a real uh, rigid structure like that, and one that's very loose and open, go for the open structure. Um, there was a point when the Homebrew Club um, incorporated. And when the people in the audience heard that, I could see that uh, uh, quite a number of them say, ah, we're a parliament now. We get to vote and make decisions. And I... <laughs> Spent some time that day telling them, no, it's not going to be that way. This is my show, and I can take it anywhere I want. Nobody had told me it was not my show. Uh, and that pretty much uh, put the damper on, the, uh, uh, on their uh, dreams of empire. Well, mostly it takes a sensitivity to the... Uh, communication that's going on and that can go on. I was fortunate to at least listen to my uh, impulses and not participate in the flow of information there. That's the interesting thing. When people in the John Doors of the world come up to me and they say, uh, I was in the meetings and they often will say, and you are saying a whole lot of really important things. Well, the fact was that I said nothing of any significance. Uh, I simply took the role of facilitator. My job mostly was to keep people from going on and on with the, what I call the, their primary information, what they really want to talk about. The structure was to try to facilitate secondary information exchange, which was, this is me, I'm standing up so you can see me, that's what we had to do in the pre-internet era, 
and uh, I want to talk about this and that and that. And that's where it has to stop and the next person gets up. Because when they start to say, and here's why, then I, speaking from the front of the room, had to exercise what stagecraft I had learned and inje interject jokes and so forth and break them up. And that's what the, in part, the, the, uh, the infamous pointer, this is not the actual one, it's just one that's symbolic. And I learned how to, to make gestures and so forth and twirl it, distract attention and so on. Um, the facilitation of the communication that matters, I mean, you, you analyze it in terms of, of, of uh, I mean, I did a, a two-layer structure there. There could have been more. Uh, I don't know how you do that exactly, but um, facilitating makes all the difference. Um, and that means not jumping into the actual primary information flow. John, did you have something? Um, John was pointing out that some of the organizations you're discussing are sort of maybe amateurish at this point, or artsy craftsy, or don't really know where they're going, or aren't going to make any breakthroughs by themselves, which is certainly true. But there is certainly precedent for organizations of that sort serving only to be a catalyst to bring together people who then do something. Um, right. One of the inventors of the transistor started a company called Shockley Transistor on San Antonio Road, which was meant to commercialize the idea of these little discrete transistors. And because of his name, all of the best device physicists in the world converged on Mountain, Mountain View to work for this guy. All the, 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 the scientists, the doctorates. And it only took them a few months to realize that this isn't what we should be doing. But having gotten there, they then exploded like a supernova exploding back out. And, and little groups of his hirees went off to start Fairchild, or went off to start National Semiconductor, or went off, you know, two of the people that he brought together went off to form Intel. Um, right. And, and Shockley Transistor itself foundered, or floundered, or whatever the word is. It's a thing of a fresh produce market now. Um, Atari uh, was doing things that were interesting with small computers or home cons computers or consumer computers or whatever. And that was remarkable at the time, but it also brought together people who looked at what was going on and thought there might be. Uh, Al? Yeah. I, I, I think you hired some people that then went on to form other. Yeah, companies. he said, this is crap. We can do better than that. There we go. That's the operative phrase. I mean, it, it's, it's only when you get there and you realize that this this isn't my vision. My vision would be something else. But I know people now that will help me realize that. Uh, Al, did you mention who it was that you had hired that had spun off to form other companies? Oh, some hippie. Steve Jobs, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah he, he was a, a, a relatively well-dressed young man when he in, brought me in to see Al looking for a job. And I didn't get the job. And High standard. Uh, too bad. Um, yes, in fact, the inadequacy of the technology and the inadequacy of the circumstances, uh, I would argue, is a, an important feature um, because it does, not, it does more than draw people together. It's, <laughs> it sends them out. It's kind of like a, a reflux stale or something in, in chemistry. Uh, things are churning and condensing and coming back and so forth. Um, that TV typewriter design was nearly impossible to get working. Um, and therefore, you learned so much more than you could ever learn from a book. And you, of course, were invested in it because you had to buy the parts and put in the time. Uh, everybody who got who, into the personal computer industry or market in 1975, and they thought $300 would get you a working computer on your desk or kitchen table, uh, probably wouldn't have done it if they had been told, by the way, you're going to have to spend at least 10 times that amount of money and a significant portion of your spare time learning things that you never realized you had to learn. Uh, and scrounging for whatever you could get whenever you could get it. 
uh, that wouldn't have been acceptable. But they were able to convince themselves, hey, I can, it's on a magazine, I can buy it, and get started that way. And in fact, it was not a, I want to use the word convergent, but it's, that's not quite real. It's less, uh, the best metaphor is that uh, it, it took on a life of its own because it's people doing it and uh, not simply mathematical functions. Uh, and when people have to put in effort, they consider they're invested in that and they will put in more effort. Uh, so I think that uh, my point really here is, yes, you're right, it's all amateurish. But that doesn't mean that nothing will happen as a result. Uh, things will happen as a result, and it would be very interesting for people to go into it looking with that viewpoint. Randall? I just finish the sentence, which is, and because they aren't trained to think of it a certain way, they will think of it a new way. Right, so right. it's that, an advantage. That, that starting as a physician building a computer means you think about it differently than someone who was trained in data processing. I would love to interview some of those physicians, uh, but I, I wasn't there as a historian, <laughs> alas. Most of us are probably holding smartphones that are a result of thinking differently. The quotes. Well, a lot, is, a lot of what we have. OK. Um, I think well, I'm at an hour, I guess. Well, you know, you and I have known each other for a couple of decades now, and I think one of the things I, like, I need to endorse Stephen Levy, who wrote the book. He was the only person that I know who was, who's written about the valley and the industry who identified the Southern California Computer Society. And I suspect you were probably the impetus for that. I now, was see, I the source. In Southern California. And I, although I did, that was just before my time, I think I know people who were part of that. And my question to you is, do you think that the vast majority of the people in the SCCS were basically non-technical? That's what did them in? I can't answer that for sure, but I do know some of them were pretty technical. I mean, they had a, a, a reasonable core of technical people, but I, I, I never really uh, yeah, I think the studied. only company that, I can, that I'm aware of in the late 70s that came out of them was very briefly Ashton Tate. But after that, nobody ever heard of them. Well, they were a big deal for... At a time. Yeah. For a while. Yes, D-Base, yeah. so forth. Yeah. Um, one of them was a parrot, right? Probably. Yeah, okay. I don't know who, whether it was Ashton or Tate. But anyway, th no, there was very limited spin-offs that could be identified. I cannot answer the question about uh, analyzing their, their membership because I simply didn't yeah. do the it work. It turns out that some of this is happening on Quora right now with both Spin-offs in the Los Angeles area and spin-offs in the San Diego area, um, you know, startups and the like. And they're all scratching their heads. And they, they had no idea of the SCCS. The other thing that I wonder about, getting back to Maker Faire and the like, is do you want to say anything about the demise of shop classes in public schools as well, too? And the death I, mean, of I, I don't think it's a big oh, deal for well. these things because I grew up with shop classes. I had metal shop, wood shop, right. and so forth, yeah. electric shop. And, and Heathkit died in the 80s. Right. I, I, in fact, learned much of electronics uh, by reading a book which was nothing but manuals, collected manuals for kits. And I finally got the point of this connection between a schematic diagram and the pictorial, the wiring diagram. Um, and uh, the availability of kits of hands-on materials that when you built them, they eventually worked, um, I think is a really important factor in uh, learning. I mean, I think you've set me up for a, 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 uh, a, something I wanted to say and didn't have the, uh, and have the opening. Now I've got it. In terms of learning, um, well, the real learning period is the middle school years, I believe. 
Certainly it happened to me. When I was 12, I was given through a phantasmagoric stroke of luck a cast-off uh, correspondence course for radio and TV repair, which actually included test equipment that arrived by mail. Um, you know, the, the chances of that happening are, some, are infinitesimal. Well, all right, leave the, the, that metaphysical question aside, but that was the right age for me to be studying my way into that. And of course, I was a real jerk about that. I ostentatiously studied the booklets and so forth in, in school and was disciplined by the teachers for doing so. And, but, but that is the age where learning makes a tremendous push. And uh, what are we providing for kids to learn with these days? Now, a lot of what there is can be found at Maker Faire, I can tell you that, kits and so forth. But a lot of those, of course, I had never heard of most of them. And uh, I have come to the conclusion that um, I would make it my goal to try to make logic design a matter of common knowledge, at least available as common knowledge for middle school students. So the theory being when, you, when kids entered high school, they had had experience or had the opportunity to have experience with logic design. And that, to me, as an engineer, unfolds into, OK, what tool do you, what device do you make? And I'm working on that. A uh, state machine with uh, an 8-bit state machine is really a reconstruction of the 16R8 uh, programmable array logic, PALs from monolithic memories. Now they're called PLDs because PAL was trademarked. And um, programmed with tweezers and mini MELF diodes in a matrix using a technology that is basically 1960s uh, vintage with 1970s vintage uh, medium scale integration chips in there and uh, LEDs showing all the uh, intermediate terms. Uh, and I know that uh, monolithic memories, uh, the, the guy who really did this was John Berkner, B-I-R-K-N-E-R, -E and I can't locate him now. I don't know what's happened. Nor do I find any reference to him on Google. Um, but they published books of projects, of things like coin acceptor logic and things of that sort. Uh, I'd love to get my hands on one of those books, but if not, there's plenty of talent around to think up projects like that. So I take the approach that the f if you need to have the artifact and then you can start developing the, uh, the uh, manifestations of it. But the idea would be that one of my heroes from childhood was uh, Charles Proteus Steinmetz. He was a hunchback dwarf from a uh, German refugee, basically, in the 1890s. He established, really, electrical engineering in the US. He came in where all these electricians, as they defined themselves, did not know how to calculate alternating current. There, it said, and I remember my thinking that when I was 12. I was like, but it goes this way and it goes that way. The average is zero. I, 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 I don't know how to calculate it. And he invented and you know, made the point about root mean square power and so forth. He brought mathematics into electrical engineering. And he worked for General Electric. Uh, and he, he had quite good publicity. And I, thus, I read a book about him when I was a kid. Um, well, <clears throat> some of the lectures he gave around that time were published. And I ran into one of them. Uh, in the 60s, I think, and a used bookshelf. And it said that there were, this was the third of three lectures. The first two lectures are no longer published because they are considered common knowledge or general, they're so well known. Well, I want to move logic design into that position. What do you mean, books on it? Everybody knows it. Well, that would be nice. It's a, it's a goal. Um, and it's possible, I think, with proper design and paying attention to how people play with it uh, to do that. One of the places I can do that, and I, I must write that out now as a kind of parting shot, is Hack the Future. This was started 
by Matt Spurgell, son of Marty Spurgell, the junk man. Uh, I think it's hackthefuture.org, but you'll have to try that. Let's see where. And this is where uh, every few months we have a, uh, an event at, uh, mostly it's been the Tech Museum, but it's also likely to be once at least in the Computer History Museum. People. Bring in 200 or 100 kids, uh, age 11 to 18, I think and have mentors there uh, who help them basically have a hackathon. Uh, Al comes there and teaches them soldering. Uh, I have my prototype of my state machine for the purpose of my learning how kids deal with this stuff. And guess what? I found out that they do not pick up the handout and read through it. I have yet to have one kid do that. Uh, so on we go uh, for that. I, I have to learn how they're going to learn uh, if I'm going to be of any use to them. I can. Uh, final. Uh, <clears throat> the the whole overview topic here, the, the maker movement, the maker bot type things, 3D assembly, 3D programming languages, um, these are all emerging technologies. And the fun thing about a new technology is that people don't know where it's headed. I, I was lucky enough to be in Silicon Valley, uh, mid-70s onward, and there really, I, I know I'm probably sounding like an old geezer, but there were there was a sort of a golden age when microprocessors came out, uh, small computers came out, early personal computers came out, where the challenge in getting a complex system to work is to make the right trade-offs. You can't do everything you want, and so there were literally dozens of microprocessor vendors coming up with whole different approaches to what processor architecture should be like. There were hundreds of, of companies selling computers to consumers. And some of them were in kit form, or some were partly assembled, or some were just circuit boards, or some were whole boxes, or some were things for use in the kitchen, or some were things that had keyboards built in. I mean, it, if you can find a, a circa 1980 early 1980 magazine and look through the ads, it's astounding how many different visions there were of where the industry was headed and how the technology could be reshaped into different ways. And then in August of 81 is when IBM introduced the first personal computer, which was sort of a critical mass that had the effect of instantly stomping on everything that wasn't it. The volume was so huge. I mean, it, it, suddenly they created an expectation of what a personal computer should be. Part of it was to go, to be so ostentatious, just to say, this is the IBM PC, which stands for personal computer. Everything that came before doesn't count. Very quickly got ignored or abandoned because now people had a, a common knowledge or common expectation of what it was they were willing to spend money for. That seemed like a, a real bad thing at the time in the sense that all the other exploration and experimentation was now snuffed out. A lot of people think that that catalyzing event is what made the industry viable and led to Intel, for instance, being able to afford to continue the research that it was doing. Um, one question is something like, I, I don't know if the IBM PC would have been then a supernova or a black hole, whether it added, you know, created something or smushed something. Would there be a catalyzing event related to 3D construction, maker bots, this event? Um, Would that be good or bad? You won't recognize it until after it's happened. That's the nature of those things. Um, I don't see why not. I mean, there will be several. Because the maker phenomenon is broader in, it, in the technologies that it deals with than personal computers were. Uh, and in, there is no one playing in the field as there was IBM in that field, in the field of computers. Uh, that event was, we knew about it at the time because they published their ROM code in the manual. And to those of us who had spent the last five years inveighing against IBM and the way they did things, 
they had suddenly reversed their way of doing things. Well, one argument might have been, yes, but that's some little, or little outfit in Boca Raton. It doesn't make any change in what the whole company is doing. <coughs> and of course now, uh, IBM appears to be uh, more or less of a Linux shop. You know, that's uh, kind of the, both the victory and defeat of it all. Uh, I don't know how to actually judge that. Uh, but in fact, IBM no longer has the same hegemonic position that they did at that time. Um, so that it was very weird when it happened. You knew something was happening here. Uh, but as they say, they don't know what it is, Mr. Jones. Um, and I, I'm sure that things like that will happen in the larger yet to have a good name, except we call it now Makers uh, phenomenon. I'm <coughs> pulling back, holding back from calling it a movement um, for reasons I won't go into now, but that's more or less sort of sentimental reasons. Um, the trouble is that you only really get to identify them in retrospect. Well, and I don't know about that. I would disagree. I mean, I didn't come from the personal computer market, but I mean, I was a freshman in college when I saw this thing called the ARPA network. And from that moment on, I knew that was the future. Well, you're a bit strange. Well, <laughs> all of us are, all of, all of us who were exposed to the ARPA network that way. And to a certain degree, I mean, that's the tradition that Google and Yahoo came out of. And um, I'm forgetting Mosaic and Netscape. Yes, of course. I mean, communication is what it's all about, in my view. And well, that clearly was communication. That was a new, uh, I almost want to say technology, but I would say a, a new universe of communication. Well, it, it was. But the thing is, um, you know, this is why Reisman, what we, you and I were at this conference in November that I, was, that I did the last session for. And part of the reason why Reisman wanted to speak was it, it was government-funded research. and. I heard these names like Bob Kahn and Bob Taylor, and they were like guys we bowed to 3,000 miles away. And at the same time, those people got a lot of criticism from both IBM and AT&T as this will never work. Oh, yeah. Kind of thing. No, it was well known what was going to work. And not only that, they said our solution is this thing called SNA, or token ring, right. or uh, any variety of other things which have all since failed. That's right. Now, in 1978, a bunch of people from various disciplines, there were, some of us were recruited on the floor of the computer shows, and Ted Nelson was one of them. I was there. Uh, Turoff and Hiltz, uh, the creators of the first real conferencing system, and a number of very significant minds were brought together at a secret conference in uh, the Stone House in uh, Rhode Island. This, it was made known to me secretly, was funded by IBM. And they were interested in uh, what we would, how we would respond to the idea of video disks as the, the technology for communication. And we did, uh, we, we, held, we discussed it for two days and came to the conclusion that video disks didn't amount to a hill of beans. What you really wanted to do was computer networks. And uh, the word I got back many years later was that the, the big name at IBM whose idea this was, was felt completely offended and completely ignored it. Um, so when there are people who know how things are going to be done, you can be pretty sure they're wrong. Uh, they will have nice jobs and publish books and have nice careers telling people how things are going to be done. Uh, but it will almost always be done a different way. And there's where I have to leave it, because otherwise I'm telling you how things will be done. I think we're out of time. Thank you.